All right. Welcome to our first uh, class, our first lesson on the divinity class on unity and diversity in the local church. We want to speak about diversity and unity for God's sake. So this is the first of seven classes. Thanks for being here and um, trying to edify and encourage and learn together. We pray that you guys will be blessed. Anyone who's watching later, I hope this is an encouragement to you as we record this. People are all over the place on Zoom, and I'm here in the study in Bellflower. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you for a chance to think about unity and diversity in the local church. We pray that you give us wisdom and insight. Holy Spirit, we need your help, and we need your strength now to encourage us to rebuke us, to correct us, to train us in righteousness, to help others grow, and also not only to be critical, but even more importantly, to see your evidences of your grace, of what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in the lives of our church family. And we pray that this would be a blessing, drawing everyone closer to Christ who listens in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start this, um, this afternoon by telling you a story of St. Bill. Bill is a member of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and Bill was not a Christian. He was a professor at Harvard, and he was teaching a class at Harvard called The Madness of Crowds. So he's a psychology professor, and he focuses on group psychology, how people work together in groups. And so he was talking about um, the madness of crowds, so mass psychology, examining like New England witch hunts, urban legends, financial panics. You could talk about um, crowd madness of crowds today with social media and politics. He was studying these things and he made a career of studying crowds. But what happened when he visited a, a, a church, Bethany, uh, not Bethany Baptist Church, Capitol Hill Baptist Church, he was not ready for it. When he went to the church, he was so impressed by uh, what he saw there. He saw the diversity of the congregation, a bunch of people of different ethnicities, different ages, different stages of life. And not only did he see diversity, he also saw a genuine love and a genuine care and fellowship among the community that he had seen nowhere else. And this guy is a scholar who studied these things. In his words, he said, quote, it was striking from the first moments I came through the door. It was clear that something special was going on. The relationships seemed not so much unnatural as highly uncommon. So I was introduced to the idea of a healthy church, a concept that had before eluded me. So the power of corporate witness, the church family together in Christ, it speaks powerfully to those in the outside, in, in the outside world. Eventually, he was trying to date someone in the church. He was in his 60s at the time. Um, he became a Christian, got baptized, joined the church, and eventually dated and married the girl who invited him as they were in their older years together. Anyways, all that to say... The, the power of the corporate community and their diversity and genuine fellowship made an impression on St. Bill. And so we're grateful for his conversion and for his salvation. So I want to ask this question at the beginning. Where did diverse, genuine community come from? Where does it come from for the church? It comes from the gospel. It comes from, it comes from Jesus Christ dying for sinners and rising from the dead and saving us so that we become Christian. Because when we become Christian, we have an identity shift. Just like when um, parents have children and then all of a sudden all their other relationships take an outer, all the relationships in their inner circle take one step out for the sake of their children. In a similar way, becoming a Christian becomes the very center of who you are and all your other identi identity markers shift one step out from the center. So now you're part of God's family, you're united to Jesus. And so you find your fundamental identity in Jesus rather than your family, rather than your ethnicity your job, your nationality, your sexuality, your personality, or any other way that the world defines you or the way that we define each other. Unity with every other Christian in Christ is more, more profound and more fundamental than every other unity that exists. So diversity then of people is the outgrowth of unity among God's people in the gospel. So diversity is probably more important than you think because diversity points to the fact that we are in Christ and Christ is our unifying factor. So Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. So, um, so, so diversity is nice for that sake, that it shows us the unity we have in Christ. 
If you have a Bible, you're going to be using it for a little bit. So make sure you have that ready for you in a second. But even though diversity is more important than we might think, diversity is also less important than we might think. Diversity is also less important because diversity is not an end in itself. In our culture today, people want to have their groups have diversity and we value diversity. But oftentimes in our world, it's diversity for diversity's sake. Let's just be diverse for the sake of being diverse. As if diversity is the goal all by itself. We love to talk about how diverse heaven is and how heaven is very diverse, but you know what? Hell is diverse too. Hell is diverse with all kinds of people um, at the same time. So um, what's more is that you can be a diverse church. We can have diversity in our church and still be an unhealthy church with no unity or no gospel unity, no Christian love. So that kind of diversity is not really what we're going after either. The diversity that was so compelling to St. Bill, our brother in Christ, is the fact that it was a Christian love and a gospel unity. So that's the topic of our class for today and for the next six weeks, we wanna think about unity and diversity. What does it practically look like, look like to be uni united with diversity? Where does it come from? How can we be, if we're the minorities in our churches, how can we be a blessing to the unity? If we're the majority in our churches, how can we, a bless how can we be a blessing to, to the church. We want to think about all of those things, but tonight or today, this afternoon, we want to think about the question, why does God care about unity and diversity in the church? Why does God care about unity and diversity in the local church? There's all kinds of reasons, but we want to look at three things here. We want to start by tracing the theme of unity and diversity in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, so we want to see it in the Bible. Secondly, we'll talk about reasons why we care about these things um, about the reasons we care about these things and how the reasons God might care, it might be different from the ways we care. And lastly, we're going to talk about um, why diversity and uni unity matter to God. And then maybe even some, some practical pointers to, to get us started for our, our, our church and for your own um, Christian growth. So let's start then with unity and diversity in the Bible. Okay. Unity and diversity in the Bible. If you have a Bible, turn to Genesis Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And if one of you want to volunteer to read out loud, you can unmute yourself and read Genesis 1, 26 to 28 for everyone, please. Just go ahead and read it. Is this just anybody reading or? Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Oh, okay. Uh, Genesis uh, 1, 26. Yeah, it's a 28. Or it's 28. 26 and 27, sorry. 26 and 27. It's 26 and 28, 27. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his, his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them uh, male and female. Okay, so here you see this very uh, the, the climax of creation. God creates man and uh, men, humanity in His image. Men and women are are creating God's image. So men and women are both image bearers; they're equal before God, but they're different. A man is not a woman, and a woman is not a man. I know that's not popular in our culture today, but that's what the Bible says. God creates man and woman, and He makes them di distinct. They're diverse, and yet at the same time, they're equal. And um, as we see. When you go to Genesis 2, look at Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. And so you have this idea of man and woman equal in image bearing, but diverse where the woman is helping the man and she fits the man and the man fits the woman together. They fit in a way that they're not identical parts. Okay. And so because of that, the way they fit together shows unity because they fit, but they're diversity because they're two different parts. And that's what it means to be in God's image. They're showing what God is like because God is also unity and diversity. How is God diversity? Can anyone think of God's diversity within God himself, the Godhead? Mom, go, go ahead. I think you said it. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So there's diversity there. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, and yet one God. One Godness, one God, not three gods. One God, three persons. And so as man and woman are made in God's image, diverse and united, it's really reflecting the unity and diversity in the Godhead itself um, or himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here you have a community of two that image God. In the Godhead itself, you have three different persons in the single Godhead. And that's the beauty. So unity and diversity really is at the core of humanity because it's at the core of the Godhead itself. God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, the one God. And that's just the beginning. When you get to Exodus chapter 4, look at Exodus 4.23 in your Bible. It's going to say something pretty weird here for us. Exodus 4.23. Does somebody want to read that about the nation of Israel? Exodus 4.23. I told you, let my son go so that uh, he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. Look, I am about to kill your firstborn son. Okay, so here is, um, yeah, it's um, God is talking in verse 22 says, Israel's is my firstborn son. And then what Tin read was um, God saying to, to Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my son go. So Israel is the son of God. That's weird. So now you have Adam and Eve imaging God, and now you have Israel as the son of God. And you guys know this phrase, like father, like, like son, right? Like father, like son. A, a son images his father. The sons look like their dads and sons reflect their dads. And so in a similar way, now you have not just Adam and Eve being the image of God. You have the nation of Israel reflecting God as sons do to a father. Their task was to image the triune God. And so now it falls on an entire nation. Um, let's see here. Uh, if you guys could put your camera or your, your microphone on mute, if you're not talking, I think I'm getting some feedback. It might be from you, Jude. There it is. It might be from the driving. Okay. Thanks, brother. You can unmute it when you're talking, but um, at least while, while, you're, while you're here, just because of the noise level. Okay. So, um, so now you have the whole nation trying to reflect God, but the nation are, are made up of different people. So you have a diversity of a whole nation, not just a husband and wife now. You have the diversity of a whole nation, all kinds of personalities, ages, stages of life, all trying to together as a nation be the son of God who reflects God to the world. Now we know from that that um, Israel didn't do too good for too long. They're supposed to reflect God in the world and be a blessing to the nations. But they fail in doing that, as we learned in Judges and further on, and they end up getting exiled and kicked out of the, the, the promised land, just like Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. But then Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, it says in Matthew 2.15, out of Egypt, I called my son. Talking about Israel and now Jesus being the son of God, who's going to reflect God. When Jesus was baptized, do you remember what God the Father said to Jesus the son when he was baptized? When Jesus came out of the water, the heavens split open and what did god say this is my son this is my son and then he said in whom, whom i'm well pleased yeah in whom i'm well pleased that's right this is my son in whom i'm well pleased and so in that um you have jesus now being made he is the image of the invisible god it says in colossians 1 verse 18 i believe um or maybe it's 14 i'm not sure but in colossians 1 he's in the image of, he is the image of the invisible god now all of a sudden you have a, a son who's who is um, well-pleasing to the Father, and Jesus reflects God perfectly. But Jesus is only one person. He's only one man, isn't he? I mean, we're talking about a married couple reflecting the unity and diversity together. We're talking about the nation of Israel doing it together. Now we're talking about one person doing it. That doesn't seem like it's much diversity. But it is because Jesus doesn't end just by him being made in the image, or not being made, him being the image of God. He actually, when he dies and rises for sinners, he starts uniting people to himself by the Holy Spirit, and he starts to embody himself, or he becomes embodied in a group of people called, called the what? The body of Christ is the what? The church. Yeah, the church. That's right. The body of Christ is the church. And so Christ inaugurates the church, and so now he displays his image of Godness in the body of Christ, namely his church. And so now you have John 13, turn to John 13, 
34 and 35 in your Bible, or John 13, 35. I already quoted it earlier, but uh, can we get someone to read that verse for us? It could be the same people who read earlier, so you don't have to wait for other people. John 13, 34 and 35. John 13, 34, and 35. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, so here Christ is saying, by this, by your love for one another, all people will know that you're my disciples. So the way that Christ is going to show himself and show his trueness is through is through um, their love for one another. So we see diversity here because you got 11 disciples who are not like each other, loving each other. You have that church now who's going to be loving each other, even though they are different from one another. So you have that there as well. Okay. And then when you get to, um, you so you have diversity, Adam and Eve, you have diversity of a nation. Then you have um, the church. And what is the church's mission? Go therefore and disciple who? Make disciples of all nations, all nations, all ethnic people groups. So now the church is going to be making disciples of all ethnic people groups and bringing all of those into the church, uniting them to Christ. And that's what it says in Isaiah 49, 6 in the prophecy of Isaiah, uh, speaking of Jesus. And it says this, it is, is, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations for the ethnicities, the ethnic people groups, that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And that's what happens in the church. Do you remember in Acts chapter 10, um, the, the gospel goes to the Gentiles, to Cornelius. Peter gets a vision and he goes to Cornelius and he shares the gospel and the Holy Spirit descends on Cornelius before Peter could finally call them to repent and believe in Jesus. They already repent and believe in Jesus and they get saved and the gospel spreads to the Gentiles. You even have this in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, we're saved by grace through faith. And then when you get to Ephesians, actually turn to Ephesians. This is probably one of the most important chapters on this topic. Ephesians chapter 2. You guys are familiar with Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, that you're saved by grace through faith. And so everyone's saved by grace through faith. But then you get to verse 13. Or verse, uh, yeah, verse 13. And it says, now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And then in verse 15. Uh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations. That's the old covenant. So that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. And so uh, he talks about those who are um, far uh, in verse 14. He's our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In verse 19, he says, so then you Gentiles and Jews, are no longer, you Gentiles are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's household. So you have here, you're the same ethnicity now. You're, you're, the, you're members of the same, you're fellow citizens. You're of the same polis, the same city, the same nation in Christ, the holy nation, and you are of the same household. So before they're divided theologically, Jews and Gentiles are divided theologically, religiously, politically ethnically, culturally, linguistically. They're divided in all these ways. And yet when Christ dies for this humanity, he unites such diverse people into one new body, one new humanity, one new nation, one new household, a new family. And why does he do this? Why does God go through all this trouble to bring a, one body, one church together through Christ? Look at chapter 3, verse 10. What's the point of all of this? Somebody read chapter 3, verse 10. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. All right. So it's to be it's so that Christ, um, God's glory, his multifaceted wisdom would be now made known. So God is doing this unity of diversity amidst diversity, unifying all of them in Christ 
so that he could show off, so he could show up and show off his multifaceted wisdom, right? To show that he is wise and he is wise. And so you have the supernatural unity that can't be explained by any other reason than Jesus Christ. And so in Revelation 7, 9, it says that people from every nation, tribe, people, and language will stand before the throne and before the lamb worshiping Jesus. So notice it's people from everywhere because of Christ. So what in the Bible seems worth living for? What should we be living for? Well, we're living for the gospel because that's where we find our unity. We're living for the great commission, spreading the gospel because by our unity and our oneness together and our love for each other, we shine the light of Christ. And we're living for the glory of God because through the unity of the church that God brings together, it shows God's glory and his goodness and his wisdom in ways that we can't show just by preaching the gospel, just by talking to people. Um, it, it has to be shown in a diverse body of people. Okay. So um, why does God care about unity and diversity in the local church? Where the answer is because God is showing his glory. And his glory is the best thing that he can give to people. The best thing God can give to others is sharing himself. And he shares himself with us by showing us who he is in his glory. That's the highest good he can do. The most loving thing he can do is let us know him. And he lets us know him not by, not, not just by looking at creation and looking at the beautiful sun and stars and the moon, not just by the wonder of the human body and human anatomy, not just by um, really good people in the world who do really great things or brilliant ideas. God shows himself that way. But the best and clearest way God shows himself tangibly to people is through churches like Bethany Baptist Church, Any go but through gospel churches that believe in Jesus. That's how God shows himself. That's how God embodies himself. That's how Christ embodies himself to people in the world today through local churches, all right? So that's unity and diversity from Genesis to Revelation. Um, any questions or comments on this before we move on? Just unmute, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask a question. Or make a comment. Um, I have a comment. Um, as it pertains to um, how you started off with this, with the story of who was the guy who, who was a scholar? Bill? Yeah. So how he um, went to the church and he saw how healthy the church was, saw how diverse the church was. Um, like that, that, that kind of makes me feel like, all right, how many people feel this way prior to um, going to a church and how do they feel when it's not as diverse you know um, is how is God's glory shown when it's not as diverse you know yeah okay uh, yeah that, that's something worth thinking about what we're going to get to in a second is um, we are going to talk about ethnic diversity but diversity has actually a bunch of different ways of showing diversity right Got so it. so ethnic ethnicity is one of them but I mean just just think about before I mean, we're in Los Angeles, right? So there's diversity here just in our, LA is very diverse as a city and as a region, but it's yeah. still pocketed off, right? So you have like, all, these ethnicities are kind of here, but it's not really a melting pot as much as places like say New York, where um, where people are forced to, to, to share life. In LA, you have a lot more of pockets of diversity of groups that are just kind of clustered around each other. But, um, but all I have to say back in the day, when you didn't have diversity in the, in the major cities, it, you couldn't have ethnic diversity, you know? And so it just depends on your situation as well. But to, to Justin's point as well, if you, are in, if you are in an ethnically diverse place, it's worth asking the question, why, is the church, why might the church not be as ethnically diverse as the community around it? That's, that's a question worth thinking about. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in the weeks to come. So Justin, you bring up an interesting point that we need to keep exploring. Um, I'll, I think we'll get to some of that in, in a second here as we talk about different, uh, different um, ways of, of thinking of diversity. So let's ask this question as we move on. And by the way, if you guys do have questions, feel free to inter interrupt me as well. Why, why, why do we care about diversity? 
why should we care about diversity? Why do we care about diversity? And why do we care about unity? So what I wanna do is I wanna give you two reasons why we care about unity. And I want you to tell me, so you're gonna to to unmute yourselves here. You guys gotta think about this. Tell me what's wrong with these reasons. I'm gonna give you some um, less, less than ideal reasons why we should care about these things. And I want you to point out what's wrong with it or what can be wrong about it. So some might say, we, we should have unity because unity means we have less conflict. What's wrong with that? What's right about it or what's wrong with it? Unity means we have less conflict. Why is that not a good reason to care about unity? I think, I think to say that unity equals less conflict is just people just don't want to get into each other's business. Right. Yeah. Because there's too diverse and there's too many unknown variables to where you wouldn't really ask deep questions to get to know one another in order. Yeah. Right. And that goes yeah. back to your whole peacemaking thing. Yeah. That's great. Dan. Yeah. So unity, when you don't, when you mean less conflict, actually it's oftentimes we don't want to rock the boat. So instead of actually saying what we're thinking or feeling or struggling with, we just don't want to say it. And so you have like a shallow unity, but we're not looking for a unity of no conflict. That's not going to happen between people who have different opinions, different perspectives, different convictions, and uh, just di they're just different people. So we want a unity in the gospel at the heart. And so we're not, we want, which means we're going to protect the gospel and we're even willing to risk conflict and destroying unity, so to speak, for the sake of the gospel. Like if we're saying, hey, let's be united around some, some other thing besides the gospel, like let's say, let's be uni united around the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, or let's be united around, um, um, you know, reaching out to a particular ethnic people group. Not, nothing bad with that, but when you put your unity in something other than the gospel, we're going to have to, or it can even be heresy. Let's put our unity around saying that nobody's going to hell. Well, we're going to have to fight for that. We're going to have conflict. So we, we don't want unity just for the sake of unity. Um, we might have to have conflict for the sake of unity. Uh, here's another bad one, and I want you guys to point out. Um, what's wrong with saying we should pursue unity because it looks good to the world? We should pursue unity at BBC because it looks good to the world. What's wrong with that? Because we're not supposed to look good to the world. We're not what? We're not supposed to look good to the world in some ways, like that we live counterculturally. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, we look good to the world in one sense because, like, we show by our love, you know, then that's what we're showing to the world. But I think also, yeah, anyways, yeah, so you're right because we want to look good, we don't want to look bad in the world's eyes just for being bad, you know. Um, at the same oh time, sorry. sorry, it's okay, yeah, at the same time, you're right, Reese. Um, if we if we, all we care about is looking good to the world then we might just do what the world wants us to do, right? So it could be a fear of man, like, oh, well, the world wants us to be this, so let's do that. And we could actually compromise with Christ just for the sake of looking good to the world. So yeah, those are two bad reasons for unity. Let's think of some subpar reasons for diversity. Because we're saying uni unity is good, diversity is good, but there's also bad reasons. What if people say, hey, we should pursue diversity at BBC so that everyone from any background can feel comfortable here? Like that's the main reason to pursue diversity so that everyone can feel comfortable at our church, no matter where they're from. What, there, there's some good there, but what's, what's good about that? What's bad about that? Any of you guys? Um, I would say um, the goal of our church is not to pursue comfort or invite, you know, us to be comfortable um i mean being being uh like sold out for the gospel is going to cause a lot of discomfort and being uncomfortable uh, but it's being um totally comfortable in christ so it's you know more so it depends on what comfort we're talking about right. we're comfortable in christ but not feeling butterflies and rainbows right. comfort i don't know yeah, no, I, I think you're right on. So we can idolize other, com like you're right. Comfort in Christ is our goal. But when we find comfort in other things as our goal, we could actually become idolatrous, right? 
So now we're idolizing comfort of, you know, um, fashion style or comfort of music style or comfort of um, whatever. I mean, there's so many different comforts we could pursue as our main comfort, our main, our main um, goal. And it actually becomes an idol when it's not what Justin said, which is comfort in Christ. So comfort in Christ is going to make us uncomfortable in other ways when Christ is actually calling us to be uncomfortable for the sake of finding comfort in him. So yeah, you're right, Justin. That's um, That would be what's wrong with that. What about this one? If someone says, we should, just like the unity question, we should pursue diversity because that makes us look good to outsiders. What's, what's, what are some dangers with that? Let's just pers let's pursue diversity so it looks good to outsiders, to guests, to people from other churches, to non-Christians. Why, why should that not be the main reason why we pursue diversity so that it looks good to others? We're pleasing man or not pleasing God. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, June. Anyone else? So pleasing man rather than pleasing God. Any other reasons why we, why this is not a good reason to pursue diversity, primarily because it looks good to other people? I think it would defeat the purpose of us evangelizing or reaching out to people who don't know God. Because I think people who are not church, they would be able to tell right away that we're just trying to please them to get them into church or to just buy into whatever it is that we were doing. Yeah. Yeah, they might, they might sense what's actually going on with us, which is a different motive rather than God's glory in their lives. Yeah, I think you guys are both right, June, Tin. Uh, another one might be um, for our church or other churches, we can be prideful. Like, look at our diversity, you know? Or we could, temp we could be tempted to manufacture diversity ourselves as opposed to just being faithful with what God puts in front of us and who God puts in front of us or where God sends us. And it can also lead to discontentment where we have an ideal diversity in our mind, like it has to look like this. And then if our church doesn't look like the ideal diversity in our minds, we can start becoming discontent and complaining or, or sinfully critical of the church or of other people. And that could also be a wrong uh, motive for diversity just to, to make it feel good to our <laughs> personal or corporate ideal or even a pastoral ideal. So remember, um, when, when Bill saw, and this is kind of going back to what Din said, when Bill, who was the professor at Harvard, saw the diversity and fellowship in the church, he's seen it before. I mean, he, he, that was his, that's what he teaches at Harvard. But what he saw was there was a genuineness there. There was a unity there that was different from way, the way he saw crowds operate elsewhere. He saw that it wasn't self-interest or self-centeredness at the end of the day. He saw that it was something beneath the surface. It wasn't a surface unity. He saw a deeper unity that, that he saw that he didn't see anywhere else. And that unity is the unity that we have in Christ. It was pointing to the power and the reality and the goodness of Jesus. And that's the goal of our unity and diversity. So why do we want to be united? And why do we want to be diverse? Those other reasons are okay. They're not the main reason. The main reason we want to be united and diverse is because we want to point to the power, the goodness, and the reality of who Jesus is. That's what we want to do. That's what Jesus does. He really makes us family. And he makes us, uh, he causes us to love people in the same family who are different than us. So we're not interested in unity or diversity just for unity's sake or just, by, just for diversity's sake. We're interested in this because we're interested in Jesus. And we want to know Jesus and we want to display Jesus together. All right. So let's ask here now to kind of close up with some practical stuff. And this is going back to Justin's earlier question about what if you see a, um, a lack of diversity in churches. Uh, let's talk about some characteristics of unity in the New Testament church and some characteristics of diversity in the New Testament church. So some people say about unity. Let's think about unity first. Some people say, you know what? All that matters is unity. So... Um, what they say is, if we just didn't have all these denominations, why do you have Baptists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists and non-denominational and Calvary Chapel and independent churches and Bible churches? Why do we have all of these things? If we could just all get rid of all of these denominations and just all agree to work together, then more people will be saved. What's wrong with that? 
There are at least two problems with that idea. One is that in the New Testament, unity is, first of all, between true Christians and not between organizations. It's between people, actual persons, okay? So not all organizations that call themselves Christian have a Christian understanding of the good news. So if you just want to put all these groups together that are calling themselves Christian, what if they're actually denying the gospel, but they're calling themselves Christians? So we can't just unite everyone who says they're a Christian just because they're saying they're a Christian. That would make us, Christ tells us to go therefore and disciple all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I commanded. So another reason why we have, uh, you know, why we're not all in one denomination is because we disagree on what Christ commanded about baptism or about how to run a church. And so that doesn't mean we don't have unity between me and a, another Christian who's from a different denomination. If we're both Christians, we're brothers or sisters. We're brother, sister, right? That's going to be true. But that doesn't mean we all need to be in the same organization because we disagree on some of what the Bible says about how to, how to live our lives and run the church. And we need to have that freedom of conscience. So that's number one, is that um, unity is, is, first of all, between two Christians who believe the gospel rather than between these denominations or an ecumenical movement. The second uh, problem with this whole organizational unity thing is the organization that the, church, that the Bible points to for our unity is the local church. We need to find ident like our unity within local churches, not necessarily between local churches. We do want cooperation. But the main unity in the New Testament is when I look at the 108 members of Bethany Baptist Church and we're looking through our membership directory, it's the unity of these people with each other. Unity within the local church, inside the local church is what matters. And that's what, um, that's what the New Testament's pointing to, would love one another, bear one another's burdens, rejoice with one another, hold each other accountable, excommunicate um, those within the church who are uh, unrepentantly disobedient. All of that is within, primarily within the local church that these commands are given. So we should be bond, bound together as a church because the 108 members should be bonded together because of our unity in Christ, because we share Jesus. Tin and Justin and June and Reese and Caroline and Johnny and Tia and others who are, I can't see on the screen right now. Our unity is the fact that we share the same Jesus who died and rose from the, gra who rose from the grave. That's where our unity lies. And as a church, it's our unity in Jesus, but not just in Jesus. As a church, our unity is also in the fact that we have the same confession of faith, right? We have a BBC confession of faith. We have the same church covenant that we don't obey perfectly, but we strive for that by God's grace. We strive for that imperfectly, but we try and we keep trying. So that agreement of how we live together as a church in collective responsibility for each other's discipleship, that's the covenant. And in our confession of faith of what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is, the fact that that binds our community as a community of 108 members of a church family. All right, so that's where our unity is. Now let's think about diversity. What does diversity look like in the church? How should it look? Now, diversity of ethnicity is important, especially in America. Given our American history, the American evangelical church, the American gospel preaching churches have a unique history of, of, of righteousness and unrighteousness in regard to the hostility and division among churches around the issue of, of ethnicity. So because we're in America, Bethany Baptist Church is a church that's in America, sent to America. We have to deal with our history of America with racism. And so for us here, even at BBC, it can't be something that we just push to the side and say it's not a big deal because all we need is the gospel. God sent us to this place and to this land. And so we need to be careful and, and intentional about dealing with um, our issues as a nation, as the as an earthly nation, the earthly nation we're part of, even as we're a holy nation trying to engage in it. So we want to we want to make sure we deal with that and 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 um, and fight against the sins of our past. Not only just of our past, I should say, in American history, but even BBC as a church, our denominational history in terms of the Southern Baptist Convention and the original sins that started that convention of pro-slavery for missionary, uh, pro-slave owners to be missionaries, even though that was evil and sinful and wrong. So we wanna make sure we deal with ethnicity, but that's not the only thing we're talking about uh, when we talk about diversity. So look at Galatians 3.29 in your Bible. Turn to Galatians 3.29. 
28, I'm sorry. Well, let's start in 27. Galatians 3, 27 to 29. Can we get a volunteer to read that? Galatians what? 3? Three? 3, 27 to 29, please. Um, for as many of you as have, wait, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. All right, so we're all heirs according to the promise. We're all Abraham's seed. We're all immersed in Christ and have been clothed with Christ. And so look at verse 28 again. There's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you're all one in Christ Jesus. So here you have a few different diversities, right? You have an ethnic diversity, Jew or Greek, ethnic, um, cultural, linguistic, religious background diversity. Slave or free, you have a social status um, diversity, and then male or female, you have a gender diversity, right? So here you have a bunch of different diversities of, of that, that you should find in the church. So I want you to think of your 10 closest friends at BBC. If we had time, we have 10 minutes, we probably could like maybe give you a minute or two. I don't know if you could list them down. You're not going to say them out loud. And I, I, I had a hard time getting to 10. I had like seven and then I just didn't know, but you probably don't have your membership directory next to you. But if you did to think of your 10 closest friends at BBC, I just want to give you a moment to at least name five in your mind, not out loud, but just think of your closest friends at BBC. I'll give you a few seconds. List them out in your mind or write them down if you have pen and paper. The reason why I want these in your mind is because I'm going to run through a checklist that I want you to, to think about in light of the names you, you're thinking of. So, so, so try to get them in your mind. Okay. Now I want to ask you guys 11 questions. Hopefully you have at least five in your, in your mind. Hopefully you have 10 in your mind. But I want to ask you a few questions here to see, um, to, for, you to, for you to run through to see if you have at least one in each of these categories. I'm going to give you a bunch of diversity categories. Okay. Number one. Looking at your 10 friends, um, do, you have any, do you have diversity of age? Do you have any, any of those 10 friends who are notice of, notably older than you or younger than you? Or are they all in your same generation? Okay, number two, diversity of political affiliation. Are any of them a different political or partisan preference or political outlook than you have? Number three, what about educational background? Maybe you have a college degree. Maybe you have a, maybe you have a graduate degree. Maybe you have a high school diploma. Maybe you didn't even graduate high school. Um, do you have people on your list without, without a college degree if you have one? Or that has a college degree if you don't have one? Different educational background. What about this? What about different income or social level? 
So um, those who are more well-off than you financially, significantly more well-off than you financially, significantly less well-off than you financially, and poor, maybe in the poverty level. Do you have friends who are close to you from different income or social levels? Fifthly, what about personality type? I don't know what personality tests you like to take. I have one personal preference for myself, but um, personality types. Do you have close friendships? Some of your closest friendships with those who have a different personality type than you. Are your friends extroverts while well, you're an introvert? Do you have any close friends that are introverts though you're an extrovert? Do you have any friends who are socially smooth even though you're socially awkward? Or do you have any friends who are socially awkward when you're socially smooth? You know, um, we could talk about all kinds of personality differences, but that's something to think about. Do you have a diversity of personality types among your closest friends? How about cultural background? Those who have a different cultural background. That could be partly ethnic, ethnically, but it could be for other reasons. Music preferences, um, li linguistic background, um, familial structures, values, cultural values. You have friends who are close to you from a different cultural background. Next, what about diversity of gender? Are all your top 10 closest friends all female if you're female? Or all male if you're male? Or all female even though you're male and you have no male friends <laughs> or vice versa? You should have a diversity of gender among your closest friends as well. You should think about that. What about of a diversity of where people grew up? That could also be tied to nationality, but different backgrounds of geography, where they grew up. And then of course, diversity of ethnicity. You have people who are of different ethnic, cultural, linguistic backgrounds, ethnicities that you are, are your closest friends. I added two more here that are not in the notes. What about relationship status? If you're single, are all your friends single? If you're married, are all your friends married? Are all your closest friends married? Um, yeah, so relationship status. And that could also mean parents. Or if you're a parent of, with young children, are all your friends parents with young children? Or do you have some grandparents who are your closest friends and vice versa? If you're a grandparent, are all your closest friends grandparents? Or do you have close friends who are single? And not even and are looking to get married. Are those some of your closest friends? There should be a diversity if we have gospel unity. Um, I could add um, sports fans, but that's just because of me, of my sports um, allegiances. But that you know, do you have differences in sports allegiances? But another one might be different temptations and sin struggles, because we do a lot of like, we do some accountability in our church. Are you only close friends with those who share the same sin struggles you have? Or do you have friends in your church, in our church, who have different temptations that are stronger to them that you don't, you can't relate to? Like, I'm not tempted by that, but I, but I love you and we're close friends, or I don't struggle with that sin. I struggle with a different sin, but, but we're still close friends. So those are questions to ask about your top 10 closest friends in this current season of your life. You need to keep all these categories in your mind as you think about diversity, Okay. How can you love Jesus and share life, your life, and share Jesus with each other amidst your differences? Okay, so um, before I close here, my conclusion, um, I want to ask you guys, where, where do you guys think BBC is doing well? Where do you think we're not doing well? Or where do you think you're doing well? Where do you think you're not doing well among these categories in unity and diversity? Or just any other thoughts and comments or questions you have before I close? I have a, a one or two, I have a closing like analogy before we close, an application. Anything from you guys? Questions, comments, thoughts? How are we doing? How are you doing? Is it important to ask some of the diversity questions to our like closest BBC friends? Like, I mean, if we're like covenanted to one another, one another covenanted to one another, like, does it matter if if we know our educational background or income or our political affiliations? Is it important to know it? Yeah. Um. Yes, because, because it's important to know each other. Like if you're saying, PJ, I don't care about these things about you, but I care about you. But like, if you care about me, like this is part of who I am. So um, we don't want to say, I don't care about anything. I, I mean, I care about you, but I don't care about any of these things. I don't care about your ethnicity. I don't care about your, your background. I don't care about your preferences. I don't care about your age. I don't even want to know how old you are. I, wanna, I don't want to know if you're married or single. 
I just want to, I just want to care about you. It's like, no, well, like if you're going to know me, you're going to have to know that I'm married, you know? So um, obviously it's like, I think the danger is if you're only caring about them because of those things, then it's not Christ in the center. But yes, if you're going to get to know people, you're going to know things about them. Does that help, Dan? Or you could push back if you're thinking of something else. Maybe I'm going in the wrong direction. I, I just, I've never been in a situation where like, okay, like the D, right? Diversity of income or social level. I've never like, I don't even know how to bring that up in a conversation. Like, You don't need to bring it up in a conversation necessarily. So these are not topics to bring up in conversation. I'm just okay. asking you, do you have friends who are like that? Like, I mean, do you mean, do you mean like you don't know a way of finding it, finding that out? I mean, like, yeah, I could look at your house that you invited me to, or like your car, or, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's markers to find out things like that, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just like, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Time out. Um, I get what you're saying, but we're asking about your closest friends, right? So I'm not talking about the people you don't, you're not close to. I'm just like, Hey, you know, we're going to hopefully Lord willing this Sunday. And we might vote in some members. There's at least uh, one that I interviewed. I have another interview this week and maybe two more interviews. So we might take up, up, to, up to four members on Sunday, right? If we do that, then on Sunday night after the members meeting, I hope none of you go up to them and say, hey, what's your educational background? You know, like, that, like your first question. I mean, you could ask that. Or, hey, how much money are you making a year? Um, so I'm not talking to him about just having these conversations with everyone. What I'm saying is, you know your closest friends, or you should. I mean, but actually to, for you, to, and to be fair to you, you're newer to the church, right? But as you get to know people more, you can just think about your 10 closest friends, even not in the church. You already know this about them because you're close. So we're talking about your close friends, not just a topic of conversation with everybody right away. I hope that helps a little bit. That's a good question though, Tim. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Question or comment? Um, just a quick comment. I think um, like we talk about racism or uh, thinking of being colorblind. Um, I mean, I would, for me personally, I'm starting to feel more and more of my ethnicity. Um, and I guess I have felt it before, but I sort of felt like I couldn't really think about it or talk about it. Cause then it, it became, maybe I was being petty or something like that. So I guess for our members, just to be aware that that's something that our members think about. Like, it's not something that um, just because we're at BBC and we love Jesus, like we're not feeling our ethnicity. So just being aware that no, like Francis is Mexican American. So I embrace that, you know, um, I guess an example would be, I mean, with our African American brothers and sisters, like when there's a, you know, a, a killing of, of an African American, like knowing that they're feeling a certain way when they come to Sunday and not assuming like, just because they're part of BBC, like they're Christians first, like, yes, like they love the Lord, they're Christians first, but they're also identifying with that African American. Um, another example for me personally was the shooting in, um, I think it was Gilmore, where there was a shooting and the guy was specifically killing um, Hispanics. And like I came to church and I mean, no one mentioned it, no one talked about it. And I don't think it was like the church was trying to be rude or mean about it. I think they just either they didn't know about what happened or just you like, it's just the news. But when I came, I felt like man, like that really hurt me personally. And so just thinking of that when we come to Sunday is, is helpful and important. I, and I think the pastors have done a, done a good job of praying about like when there's particular new situations of shootings and stuff like that or killings is like we talk about it, we pray about it. So I think it, it's just helpful to know that as members when we come, like we are a certain ethnicity and taking that into account is, is helpful. And it's a, yeah, it's helpful in discipling. It's helpful in gospelizing. So anyways, that's all. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's important to um, not universalize your own experience, especially when you're in the majority culture. So that's it's always hardest for the majority culture to be aware of the pressures of those who are minorities. Um, though there is a, diver a diversity of Asians, there is an Asianness to the church now. When I first got here six years ago, it was mostly Anglo or European American. And so I was constantly trying to decenter that. It was easier for me to, to do it just by my very face because I'm not European or Anglo American. But um, now that Asian Americans have become kind of the majority in our church, um, there was a time where people were asking if I didn't like Asian Americans. <laughs> and I understand the question, but like I'm always, I, I'm try, as a pastor, one of the pastors, we're trying to decenter the majority culture. It's easy for the majority culture to hit a status quo and just expect everyone to kind of revolve around that. Whatever the majority is, it's not a knock on anyone. It's just when you're comfortable and you become a majority, you start to forget what it's like when you're the minority. And so um, it's important to always push that, like just to remember that. So um, yeah, whether it's, yeah, ethnic, ethnically or the other, the other things we we're talking about here. So anyone else, question or comment? All right. Well, let me close by giving an analogy and then an application here. So marriage would be a good analogy. So husband and wife, how they are not the same person. So a husband and wife in, in marriage, the two become one flesh. So there's a unity there, but they are different from each other. And it would be wrong for a husband to expect the wife to just agree with and be everything the husband is. It would be wrong for the wife to expect that of her husband as well. So in a marriage, you should be valuing, cherishing, and protecting the differences of your spouse. Value the differences, cherish them, protect them. At the same time, as a married couple, you should pursue unity. You should pursue unity. And so you should try to get to know them, try to protect their differences, and, and then pursue unity together in the ways God's calling, to, calling us to. And that's the same thing at a church. So much more in the church. We should value, protect, and cherish our differences. We should also pursue our unity in Christ together as one church family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as God's household. And so my one application to you, challenge to you, brothers and sisters, is take your membership directory that you have and um, pray for, pray that God would help you connect with someone this week who's different than you in one of these categories. So I gave you a bunch of categories that, of differences. Pray that God would put on your heart one or two people who are different to you, than you that you don't know that well right now as of today. And then pray that God would give you opportunities to reach out to them this week, to connect with them on Sunday. And let's make that real practical that on Sunday, we intentionally seek to stir and encourage someone to love and good works who's different than us in the same Christ that we share. All right. So that's a, that's the closing application. Um, we need God's help to do this. So I'm going to close our time in prayer. We, it's not just to close in prayer because we always close in prayer, though that's a good habit. It's because we desperately need God's help to pursue unity and to protect our diversity um, 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 amongst each other as Christians, okay? So let's pray. Father, we desperately need your Holy Spirit to show us Jesus so that we might share life and share Jesus with one another in this church. God, thank you for the 108 members of Bethany Baptist Church. We praise you that we are not like each other in so many ways, and we praise you that we are like each other in the most important ways, made in your image, sinners saved by grace, sharing the same Lord, Savior, and treasure, sharing the same convictions in our confession of faith, and sharing the same agreement in our church covenant to love each other as a church family. Thank you, Father, for our differences. Help us to value, protect, and cherish them. Thank you for the unity that we have and the unity you call us to pursue. Help us to work hard to maintain the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. And we pray, Lord, very specifically for our church and even for those who are in this class right now, those who watch this before Sunday, that you would put on our hearts different members to love and engage and to share our lives and to be vulnerable with and go deeper in our friendships with across different genders, ages, generations, ethnicities, uh, political preferences, educational background, social or income level, personality type, cultural background, um, where we grew up, relationship status, temptations and sins. Help us to bear with one another in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.